Uh, good evening, everybody. I've just been told it's time to kick off, so um, we'll make a start. Um, a warm welcome to everybody. Um, I'm Christina Boswell. I'm Vice Principal for Research and Enterprise at the University of Edinburgh. And this evening, I have the very great honour of presenting the 2022 Tam DL Prize for Excellence in Engaging the Public with Science um, to a very worthy recipient, Dr. Sinead Rhodes, and you'll hear from Sinead in just a minute. Sinead is a Senior Research Fellow Psychologist at the Centre for Clinical Brain Sciences within the College of Medicine and Veterinary, Veterinary, Med Veterinary Medicine. Sorry. And, and she's put neurodivergent young people at the very heart of her research programme and her clinical work. Um, and what's so distinctive about the way Sinead works, and one of the reasons she's been selected uh, for this award, is that her work is informed by what's called a priority setting exercise. And this is when research questions and priorities are not gathered and defined based on uh, other researchers in the community or the existing literature, uh, but from people with lived experience of a condition. And the approach then sets its research questions based on the priorities and concerns and issues raised by this group um, in order to improve their quality of life. So engagement with children and with lived experience is very much at the heart of Sinead's work. And Sinead hasn't just applied this approach in her own work, but she's very much encouraged uh, her research group um, and those around her within the university and beyond to try out and experiment with these methods. And she's really made a significant contribution to enriching her research environment. Um, her approach is creating new ways of involving our communities, not just in learning about the results of science, but in co-creating that science. So through this award, we commend Sinead for her leadership in this area, and I think it's very much in the spirit of the Science Festival as well, uh, not just disseminating and informing publics, but engaging publics and those who will benefit from research in co-creating that research. Now, of particular note in Sinead's work is the EPIC project uh, through which she's ensured that children with a range of different types of learning difficulties have a key role in shaping guidance on support strategies for parents and teachers and her work on EPIC led to her being awarded a cross-aspect innovation fellowship from the Economic and Social Research Council with, it, with which she's going to set up a not-for-profit community interest company um, to embed the provision of this project of the EPIC service um, in routine clinical and educational practice. And I think Sinead is going to tell us something about that um, in a minute. Um, I want to say a little bit more about Sinead's uh, leadership, which extends far beyond her group and uh, 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 really is, is, is very critical to work within the university more general, generally um, because of her role within the wider Edinburgh neuroscience uh, network and through this she's really demonstrated outstanding community spirit she's incredibly generous with her time I don't know how she manages to fit it all in um, and offers her expertise and skills to others across the college and the university um, and finally I wanted to mention some of her wider public engagement initiatives um, she founded and chaired the research the headlines project in the Royal Society of Edinburgh um, and this is a project that ensures um, that research is communicated to the public in an accessible way, including through a series of an extensive series of blogs that Sinead has curated that have been read over 260,000 times across 199 countries. Um, and Sinead has encouraged early career researchers and school children to contribute to the blog, um, including through a primary school competition rewrite the headlines and this led to her being awarded the RSC medal for innovation in public engagement. So this is really a remarkable list of achievements I'm sure you'll agree for one single colleague, colleague and at the mid-career stage uh, of, her, of her career. Um, so Sinead's really an enormously worthy recipient of this TAM <coughs> DL award um, and I think it really, really well reflects the range of interests and achievements um, of TAM DL, which straddle teaching and scholarship and journalism, as well as his career 
uh, in politics. So I'm now going to invite Sinead to the stage to tell you more about her work. Um, and you'll have a chance to ask her some questions after her lecture. Thanks so much for uh, a wonderful introduction. Um, this evening, I'm going to give you an overview of my research and public engagement work that's focused, as you've already heard, on facilitating better understanding and tailored support for neurodivergent children and young people. What do we actually mean by neurodiversity? It simply means that we all experience the world and interact with the world around us in different ways. Being neurodivergent means that you think, learn and respond in different ways than most of the population. That being said, being neurodivergent is very common. Typically around 20% of all people if we take the broadest definition of neurodivergent. My research has mainly focused on some of the more common conditions within this. ADHD, autism, and dyspraxia, otherwise known as DCD. And most of this research has focused on children during the primary school years and early high school, so from around five to 15, which is the age at often at which these conditions are picked up, where we see signs of learning difficulties, difficulties in peer relationships, and simply in navigating the complexity of the school environment. These conditions are associated with poor developmental outcomes, unfortunately, and these include a range of different factors. So first, this includes academic, academic learning and attainment. So for example, a recent study that looked at neurodivergent young people around 16 and compared them with their peers, they had achieved on average around two GCSEs. This was an English study compared to their peers who had achieved around seven. And this is quite striking because the groups were matched on aspects like parental education, their economic background, which are the usual factors that you would expect to predict academic learning. These children also often have difficulties in relationships across development, and this can include peers, can include family members, and other adults. Probably the most challenging, striking um, difficulty outcome these children have is their risk of developing mental health difficulties. Around one in two will develop depression and or anxiety, which is a very different picture than the general population. But also I think what's more striking is the fact that they most commonly develop these symptoms while still a child or early adolescent, which again is a very different picture from the general population when we typically see the developmental, development of mental health difficulties in late teens and early adulthood, as well, of course, the, those difficulties being much less common in the first place. There are a number of barriers to improving these developmental outcomes, unfortunately. Children in the UK and beyond are on long waiting lists for assessment of their needs and diagnosis. So for two of the most common conditions that I research, ADHD and autism, this is typically around two and a half to three years and can actually be longer. While they're on these waiting lists, parents often say that they feel that they need more support, more support that's focused on understanding and supporting their individual child needs. Teachers and head teachers echo similar. They commonly say that during this time and actually beyond that they need more help to understand and support these children. Another common barrier though to improving these outcomes are misconceptions and misunderstandings around these conditions. And research has really progressed, you know, huge in, in the 25 years I've been doing this research, 
we really do have a much better understanding of these conditions, but we need much more research in this area to improve um, these mis misconceptions. But what we also really, really need to do as researchers is to get the outcomes of our, our, of our research, our findings, outputs out into society, out to the people who need it in a way that's accessible to them, or otherwise, you know, these misconceptions are, you know, going to persist. So how do we as researchers ensure optimal understanding and support for these children? If you look quite generally at people who take part in research, so for example, people who have any kind of health condition, they'll, and they take part in research quite routinely, they'll often say nothing about us without us. So they want their voice to influence the kind of research decisions and practices that are, are made. And you know, this is the moral and, and right thing to do, but it also really makes sense you know, how can I ask a parent, teacher and child to engage in various practices if I haven't asked them what their preferences are, um, if I haven't asked the young people what's acceptable to you, um, if I haven't checked what's actually feasible to do in the home and school context. And I really feel that to fully understand a condition and to develop appropriate supports that make a difference, we need to listen to the lived experience of those who are experiencing those conditions and those who care for them, their families, and who work with them, the, the professionals. Now, a lot of the work that I've done in this area, I've, you know, across 25 years, always engaged with the public. Often, this is very informal like going to a parent support group and chatting to parents, or having a phone call with a teacher or visiting a school and, and speaking to, to, to teachers and, and, and the class. Some of it has been more formal. So, you know, I've conducted research with children and teachers, research interviews, and then we've gone on to publish them. I was very fortunate a few years back to be part of, um, and you, you heard this in, in the introduction, a much more systematic, thorough approach to incorporating the voice of lived experience in research. And this was actually incorporating their voice, what their opinions were, and what we as researchers should investigate in the first place. So the research questions that we have. This was called a James Lind Alliance Priority Setting Partnership, so it's over a hundred of, of these now conducted across every um, area of health that you can think of. And this one was focused on neurodivergent children and young people and was led by the late Anne O'Hare. This was her, uh, a really big idea and really important project to her. She was a professor of paediatrics here at the University of Edinburgh and she really was a pioneer in emphasising how critical it is to include the voice of, of lived experience in research practices, right down to what we research in the first place. This was a very large scale study, so just to give you an idea, it was two years of uh, someone working full time, I, Lim, that you can see there, but several of us working you know, very part time on it. And during this time, we conducted two very large scale surveys. I say survey, it can sound like something, you know, that's quite brief and quick. The first survey generated over 800 questions from young neurodivergent people themselves, from parents and a range of professionals, health, education and charities. And we then, as researchers, the research team, went back to the literature to see which of these questions had been answered in full, or was often the case in part, and was often the case, you know, not appropriately um, addressed completely. So there was a real synergy between those with lived experience and who care and work for them, and the, the researchers. This project, it actually ended in this room. <laughs> um, I remember being in, in this room very well at a workshop. So a workshop is, is the end of this project where young people, young neurodivergent people themselves, 
parents and the range of uh, professionals that I've described came together here in a workshop day to agree on the top 10 questions that they want research to examine. But did they, really all, did they all really feel that they had an equal voice in this? So for example, can you have parents in the same room as professionals feel like they're making an equal contribution? And of course we did um, evaluation work on this and this was very reassuring. You can see a quote from a parent there. Parents felt they were properly involved in research and commented on how valuable this uh, approach was. The professionals commented similar and commented on the complexity of getting such a diverse group together. But as I said, no one went away feeling their views had not been heard. But of course, it's quite easy you know, for an adult professional to say that. What about the young people? And as you can see from the quote there, this young person said, it's so good that young people have had as much of a voice in setting the top 10 as parents and professionals. And this was so reassuring to us because it suggested that the young people who were neurodivergent actually felt that they made an equal contribution. And here you can see them holding up the top 10 questions. You can probably remember from 10, 20 minutes ago when you walked in, that's the steps just outside here. And they're flanked by parents and a range of different professionals who helped them come to those questions. So over the next little bit, I want to just describe, I'm going to describe two projects that took these questions. They're quite general questions that took them and through different, uh, through different work to, uh, in the community, were able to develop them into testable research questions. So the first question is uh, a project led by Alva McKinney, who's here this evening, and she's a PhD researcher in my team. Alva is actually enrolled on a very new PhD programme here at Edinburgh. It's a four-year PhD research with public engagement PhD programme. The extra year involves public engagement work that's integrated across the four years. So this kind of practices and activities that I'm describing are at the heart of all the decisions that Alva has been making in her research. She took question 10 from that exercise and you can see it's quite general. So that, uh, uh, that exercise involved a focus from zero to 25. So you can imagine how many transitions, especially if you think about educational transitions versus clinical service transitions. So what Alva did was conducted interviews with autistic adults, adults with ADHD and with dyspraxia to identify what were the further priorities, more specific priorities that they had. And they very commonly focused on the transition from childhood to adolescence, and particularly for girls, that this was an area they felt really needed more research. And through these workshops and interviews, not only with the adults, but also with teenagers who are neurodivergent, Alva identified a number of themes that have become the focus of her PhD. So themes of masking, we know neurodivergent young people often hide or mask is what is referred to in the literature, their characteristics that they show, their ADHD, autistic, dyspraxic characteristics. Fitting in was another theme and puberty, if, if you think about the stage. And in this regard, we take a multidisciplinary approach. So one of Alva's other supervisors is academic gynaecologist, Jackie Mabin. So the idea here is we have the full expertise to be able to address these questions in full. And Alva addressed a number of, of, she's developed a number of questions for her PhD. This is one of the examples. And I'm giving this example because it was really heavily influenced by the adult women looking back. So early on in my talk, I mentioned about the poor risk of mental health 
in these conditions and we are really focused on trying to identify what puts someone in the 50% versus not risk. And what Alva was getting overwhelmingly from the autistic women, women with ADHD and dyspraxia, looking back, they felt a link between hiding their characteristics, being autistic, hiding this, and later mental health difficulties. And Alva is now very actively recruiting data um, and looking at this um, and following um, her, her sample up over time, which is um, a really uh, important way of looking at this. So I'm going to talk now about the second project, um, which I've been very heavily focused on for the last few years. And before I even saw these questions, I've obviously, th this um, project was, was conducted about four years ago now, but I've been doing this kind of work, talking to neurodivergent young people for, you know, over, over a couple of decades, and also their parents and professionals, and they resoundedly emphasise they need to know more about strategies and supports for these young people, and more formally, programmes and interventions. But across those areas, you can see that the various ad hoc informal work I've done over the years was absolutely captured within the top four questions. I've just summarised them, I've not given the full questions, but it's all about the knowledge, skills and training. Professionals need to work with parents to achieve the best outcomes. What programmes, strategies and more formally interventions are effective? What ages and stages are they best introduced? And my research over the last few years has really focused very strongly on this. But what about existing support programmes? There are quite a range of interventions and programmes available to neurodivergent young people. Many of them are condition specific. So what I mean by that is that they have been developed, for example, as is actually the most common case for autistic children or you know, for, for another neurodivergent condition, but specifically for that condition. And that's quite problematic in a number of ways. So for example, Quite often, some of the more the children with the more common conditions, these interventions actually can't be applied to them. But it's also actually very problematic for that particular child. So, for example, an, uh, an intervention that's been developed for autistic children um, being applied to them because we know these conditions co-occur. It would actually be very unusual to just be autistic. Of course, many people aren't diagnosed with a second condition, but that doesn't mean to say they don't have characteristics of another condition. So it's very common, for example, for an autistic young person to also have some ADHD symptoms or to be dyslexic or, or you know, have some characteristics of, of dyspraxia. There have been more generic programmes developed that are suitable for other conditions or you know, across the conditions. Many of these focus on parenting or focus on you know, the child's behaviour. So the idea is here that we're trying to shape or you know, uh, influence or change the child's behaviour. There's been extensive research over the last few decades and my research has really, really focused on this area, but there's extensive research across labs you know, in the UK and beyond looking at the factors underlying those, that behaviour. And this research has really now unequivocally shown that neurodivergent children and young people show difficulties in what we call their thinking skills. So this includes, for example, memory, being able to hold and organise information in your memory. Attention, being able to focus your attention, but actually being able to divide your attention between different tasks, which is just much more difficult. Being able to be flexible in your attention and move your attention to different parts of a task or a new task. Planning, being able to set a goal, but working out the steps that you need to do and in the right order to achieve that goal. Inhibition, being able to inhibit your response to a distractor. You might hear a little beep or something and you're, you're trying to you know, not uh, respond to that so you, that you can focus and generally, you know, being able to control your responses. And there have been some programmes that have focused on 
uh, working on these areas, but particularly focused on memory. So you may have heard, you know, brain training, memory training. This kind of research has had mixed success. Often, you know, it's been quite limited. There are a number of challenges here. Firstly, it is very common, it's actually the most common scenario that neurodivergent children will show difficulties in more than one of these um, conditions, uh, processes. So for example, memory and attention. But a real difficulty here is that neurodivergent children differ from one another. And we've done extensive research over this, trying to show the ADHD profile, the autistic profile, etc. And then when that wasn't working, let's look what happens when it co-occurs. None of that really works. It doesn't really map on to their diagnostic label. So what is that telling us? It's telling us each child, each neurodivergent child, needs to be understood individually. Of course, they'll cluster together. So if you have 100 neurodivergent children, you'll see children who look more alike. But this is very problematic because that doesn't necessarily fit with the specific diagnosis. And it's been out of all of this research and this understanding um, that we've developed what's called EPIC. EPIC stands for Edinburgh Psychoeducation Intervention for Children and young people. The P for psychoeducation is really, really important. Now, psychoeducation is a general term. It's, it's used for understanding lots of different conditions. But with EPIC, it's not about understanding ADHD or understanding autism. It's about understanding that individual child. We take a strengths and difficulties approach with this programme. So it's about the adult working with the child to identify areas of strengths. These children have many strengths. Many of them have special interests, things that they're really interested in, and they can focus and persevere in a way that is you know, phenom phenomenal on their you know, particular interest. Many are you know, very resilient. Of course, what's the strength for one person can be a difficulty for another. And of course, you, you know, if you know anything about ADHD, you'll know they're often risk takers. And this is often seen as problematic for most parents. Um, saying risk-taking behaviour is problematic. But we can actually channel this in a positive way to being decisive. With EPIC, the whole approach has been influenced by young people, not just influenced, actually co-produced. They've partnered with us and developed this with us together and their parents and education and clinical professionals. Down to the research questions that we're looking at, as you've already heard, but also the practices, so that we've engaged young people. What games do you like? What activities do you like? We've done considerable amount of feasibility work. I can go and ask parents and teachers to do various practices, but however well-meaning that is, or well-researched, does it actually work in the home and even more complicated, busy, chaotic school environment? How can I, as a researcher, without going into those environments, without hearing their voices, know what, what works. And we've also, in, in relation to outputs, developed a range of outputs. These include booklets, but also we have videos and a whole range now of more detailed resources. And every word has been read by numerous teachers, educational psychologists, clinicians. Um, we've had young people involved um, in, in developing a lot of the resources with us as, as well. Because they have to be accessible to them. They have to be useful to them. They have to have activities in them that they can actually do in, in their classrooms. With EPIC, we aim to change the lens through which the child sees themselves and, if needed, their parent and teacher. Many of these children find daily life activities very difficult. They find their peer relationships difficult, the school environment very, very difficult. And we really want to turn that on its head and see identifying the difficulties as an area for opportunity, for actually then being able to understand and then support that child. 
So at the heart of EPIC is empowering the child with an understanding of themselves and then upskilling them with a toolkit of strategies that's tailored to them that they can use in familiar and new situations, supported by their parents and teachers. What does that actually look like? First, as I've described, we take a strengths and difficulty approach. So I'm going to just talk you through how a teacher might use our booklets to work with a child. So they will look at a list of strengths, things that I've described like resilience, being able to focus on a special interest, risk taking, etc. And agree together. So the child and adult will agree together what are areas of strength for them. And then they'll look at a list like this and they'll identify together what areas they need to work on. Okay, so again, taking you know, quite a positive approach. Now this might seem straightforward, but again, this is where the research actually shows it's really tricky. One of the main um, conditions that I have examined over the years is ADHD. The A stands for attention. So, the, you know, and this is where we go back to the misconceptions, your understanding would be that a child sitting in front of you with ADHD has an attention difficulty. My research has consistently shown across studies that much more of these children have difficulties in the other thinking processes, particularly in memory. But how can that be? Okay, so think about what it means to be able to listen to me, to encode, to put that information into memory. These children, they can actually do that. And if you ask them to respond straight away, they can do that. So for many of them, they were able to pay attention. But what happens is that the information seems to disappear really quickly. So for example, if you think about the child listening to an instruction or listening to a story, children will be rehearsing and doing different things, thinking about how it relates to something. These children seem to not automatically put those strategies in place. So they act like they're not paying attention. They act like they're not following instructions, but actually information has disappeared more quickly from their memory. So what the adult and child do is a, a, a variety of activities to try and focus down what actually is it for this child. And these lists have been designed to help inform that. And the teacher might agree with the child, the issue is following instructions and remembering things both of which are highly likely to need memory strategies. So then they'll go to the strategy resources, and I've said we've got quite a wide variety of resources. I'm just going to go through um, the booklets. And we've taken lots of ideas from the memory literature. There is absolutely decades of research in the psychological literature showing how you can help um, a child and young person and you know, even adults' memory. What we've done though is really work with parents and teachers to see what's actually feasible in the home and school environments. And it's simple things like what we call in psychological literature chunking or breaking information down into parts and then writing it down. And we encourage parents and teachers to have mini whiteboards and other you know, um, pieces of, of equipment or even pieces of paper as a go-to and it's really a reminder that, you know, it's a visual reminder that um, they need to think about their memory, that their memory might work a bit differently from their peers. Simple things like rehearsing or repeating information, that might seem really straightforward, but we, people who are not neurodivergent, automatically just do that. These children seem to forget and they often don't elaborate or deeply process information. And again, we want to find out what the interests of these children are. Many of these children have a real interest in, you know, little uh, items or figures. Many are very interested in Lego. And we can use those to really engage the child in terms of being motivated, because it's their special thing. But also, things like Lego are absolutely brilliant for doing numeracy, because each piece can represent a number. And the child is really active there. They're holding the items and being an, active, um, being an active part of the learning. 
Another area that's a common difficulty for neurodivergent children is thinking flexibility. And again, we look at the kind of games and activities that these children like doing, like playing. And for many of these younger children, they like games like snakes and ladders, Ludo, uh, you know, etc. Et and I want you to think about if you're going to play a game like snakes and ladders, and you're playing away, and then you're halfway through, and suddenly the um, other person says, we're going to change the rules. We're going to go down the ladders and up the snakes. You'd be probably fine with it, but it's a little bit frustrating, and you might actually forget and keep going up the ladders, etc. For children who are neurodivergent, they often actually find this kind of thing quite difficult. So some of them won't notice that the rule has changed. So even though you've said the rule has changed, they'll just keep going with the response. And think about what that looks like in the normal class situation. A child is doing a task and the rule has changed, the response has changed, but they're still keeping with the response that we're doing in the first place because that was correct at one stage. Now you can see why these children get frustrated, have an emotional response because they can't seem to complete a task. And what we do in this EPIC approach is have dialogue with the young person. We have dialogue with them about that to try and get them to practice and to have insight into that, um, into that process. For many neurodivergent children though, they absolutely notice that change. And it's the change that they really find difficult and have a lot of anxiety about. And what we're trying to do here is practice it in a really fun, you know, safe, you know, comfortable way. And then we'll do other games like card games where we switch um, the rules or, you know, change the response. And again, the strategy is individual to every child. So some children will just want to practice this. Others will want to chat with us, what we call have, have dialogue about it. Others will need a movement break or some other kind of strategy to make it work for them. And we practice these in a game-like way before we would move to things like classwork and you know, model it on the more difficult things that we want to ultimately focus on. With EPIC, we have key phrases. So, for example, if you do persevere and get to the end of the game, regardless of what strategy you needed to, you switched it up. And we have other phrases like, I made a plan, stop and think, etc. And the, in, in, the, in the latest project that we've been doing, we've been really trying to develop this. And Iona Benj, who's the postdoctoral researcher working on this, has looked into a, way, a range of ways in which we can really help the child internalize the key phrase. And one simple idea, but being really effective, is to use stickers. Children are really motivated by them, but they're then walking around with, I switched it up, my plan rocks, star, stop and thinker. So again, this visual reminder. This is not about the parent and teacher forevermore repeating constantly, stop and think, make a plan. The idea is to help the child internalize it. So they're automatically thinking about this themselves. So when they're doing a task, whether it's a game with a peer or whether it's a learning task, stop, it's not really working, stop and think. So the, the, the phrase comes to mind and they can better navigate how to more successfully complete that task. Initially, we ran what's called a researcher-led program of EPIC. So this is where a member of our team went out and planned the sessions and delivered the sessions. This is quite a small scale project, but and it was an eight week project involving 16 sessions. So eight with the child and then eight split with the parent and teacher. But actually we found significant differences, even though it was fairly small scale, between those who received the intervention versus those who, who didn't take part. And they showed improvements in a wide range of aspects like their thinking skills, a range of aspects of literacy, and parent and teacher reported um, behavior. But we, of course, in this kind of style, also interviewed the children, parents, and teachers. 
And this really gave us really valuable data in showing that the children were better understanding themselves and were applying strategies. So within this study, children who were recruited were actually on waiting lists. And there was one child at the beginning who said, I don't think I have ADHD. After he'd participated in the program for eight weeks, his mother said, he continually at times of difficulty says, my brain is really busy at the moment. And she inferred that he was better able to articulate in difficult scenarios, especially in school, that he was finding things difficult. In terms of strategies, we've had teachers in their interviews post-programme say that they noticed that the children were using a lot of the strategies that we'd done with them. But some of them, even better, commented that they were doing new tasks, they'd move on to new work, and the child was developing a new strategy, said old strategies aren't working, I need to use a new strategy, which is absolutely brilliant. And this is the empowering you know, part of it, that they are empowered to understand um, that they need a, a new strategy in the first place. Um, so that sounds ideal in many different ways, but if we think about the ethos of where this approach is going about empowering people, a researcher-led program where a researcher plans and delivers everything isn't necessarily fully keeping with that ethos. We've also been starting to think, at, well at that time we were starting to think about what would this look like translated from a research study into something in the community. And something like that involving all those sessions, so for every one of those sessions you've got to plan it with other people in the team, it's very, very expensive. It's not cost effective. Around this time also we were developing those booklets that I've shown and the parents who were giving us feedback from them weren't taking part in a research study. And they were commenting things like, I'm sort of using this in my own program. I'm using these, these booklets, they're really useful, but I could do with a little bit more support. You know, it'd be great to have, um, you know, uh, some more ideas, but also maybe interaction with a person to chat through the booklets. So out of this came the self-delivery with support program. The with support is really important. Parents in particular have continually told us we don't just want signposted to resources. We need resources with some support and that support is person time. So what we've done over the last 18 months, and we actually just finished this project on Friday, is we have interviewed parents and teachers as, as they've gone through this self-delivery with support programme and offered help at different points and asked them, when do you need help? I, get, I offered X, Y and Z help at this point. Was that actually what you needed? Which, which was most useful and at which time points? And the idea is, again, listening to parents and teachers about what they want supported. And this work has shown that they were empowered to um, deliver the programme themselves, you know, with some support from us and able to upskill the children as well as themselves. And they fundamentally commented in the feedback, though, that they felt supported while doing this. Not surprisingly, like all of my other work, parents and teachers have not just um, kind of slightly altered this. They fundamentally changed some of it in terms of the way that we're deliver delivering it. So teachers, for example, one commented, I'm going to use this in a whole class approach. Is that OK? We were like, absolutely, you know, be really interesting to see. And that's been really positive. So it's about all children learning about their attention and memory, which, you know, is, is, is a good thing. And it's really then inclusive for the neurodivergent children because everybody is doing it. In broader work that I've been doing, other teachers have fed back that they don't really like the idea of a programme or, you know, it might suit certain times of the year and not others and asked us to try and package this differently in terms of being able to tap into certain resources in different ways and at different times. Parents have also given us feedback and many of them, um, many, many parents commented that things that we've suggested like doing two 45 minute sessions in a structured way just really wasn't working for them. And actually 
they were saying that they were integrating it into daily life, so they were actually doing these things every day. Parents were coming back to us saying, we were doing baking, we were doing crafting, and realised the planning and the steps and all the different memory and, and you know, these activities that we were doing, that we like doing, um, that we do commonly in our house, could be used. So we adapted the same principles and used them. And that's, again, absolutely great. We don't want just people to just do this for the eight-week period. We want them to continue with this. Um, and doing it in that way is, of course, going to integrate it into daily life. So over the last couple of years, we've been focused on developing this from a research project into uh, a service that could be applied in the community. And this will be called Epic Think Learn. And this will involve a set of services, some of which are still in development, but already with our already developed services, with LinkedIn resources for parents and teachers to understand and support neurodivergent children. A lot of the children that we've worked with are on waiting lists for assessments. EPIC is suitable straight from that point. It does not require a diagnosis. If you think about what we're doing in terms of understanding and supporting the individual child. And as you can see in that bubble, so this was feedback from a parent who took part, who's on one of those long waiting lists. They felt that they had improved their knowledge and you know, they refer to um, a tough time. But this is important, this being suitable from the, the time point a child joins a waiting list, not just because that's such a long wait and parents and teachers need more support during that long wait, but also coming back to the research. Unusually compared to other groups, I've done a lot of research with children on waiting lists rather than fully diagnosed. Initially, this was because I was doing a lot of research with children with ADHD, and we try and take, uh, involve them in research prior to taking medication. And of course, as soon as they're diagnosed, um, or you know, at some point after they, they take medication. So this was a way to um, uh, avoid you know, them already being on medication. But actually, as we were doing this research, and then following the children up and past diagnosis, and looking at our findings and comparing those children on their thinking, on their learning, on their peer relationships, behaviour, well-being. What we find is the children who do receive a diagnosis and those who don't do not differ in the severity of difficulties they have across those areas. So, of course, the children who don't receive a diagnosis have fallen short you know, of a, of a symptom, maybe two, so they haven't received the diagnosis, but they still have the same severity of difficulties. So offering this type of service to a child and parent at the point at which they join a waiting list is, is really, really important. They all need it. I've talked a lot about the parent and teacher supporting um, the, the neurodivergent child or young person. And some of you will have come here because you're a parent or education or health professional, you know, working in that area. But many of you will have come here for other reasons, you know, out of general interest, um, etc. Do we all have a role? Do the general pu uh, public have a role in helping understand and support these young people? What I want you to think about is the statistic I gave in the beginning, that 20% of people are neurodivergent, if you take the broadest definition, with all conditions. That means that when you meet a neighbour, a colleague, someone at the school gates, a friend, you're highly likely in a given week to meet someone who is neurodivergent. It might be them as an adult, or it might be their child. So it's really important that we all learn about neurodiversity and you know, learn and understand what that means. And where do we, of course, if you come to a talk like this, you're learning all about neurodiversity. But in general, where we get our information from is the print, broadcast, and social media. 
And you'll see very commonly headlines like this. And how do we know whether these headlines are misleading or informative? This refers to researchers. So, you know, are, are we going to be informed and trust this? In many cases, it's actually quite difficult to decipher that if you don't have, you know, special um, skills in that area. What I want you to think about is a parent on one of these three-year waiting lists who have been awaiting an assessment for autism and they finally got to the top and for many parents that's really really difficult but for others it's very empowering and if someone and you can see the social media icons in your network suddenly shares this oh it's an epidemic everybody is being diagnosed with autism and for you you'd finally come to a place where you felt that you could articulate to other people this is why you know, your child or young person was having these difficulties. And then you know, you're seeing this. But it's very, very difficult. We all need to be more critical consumers in society of the information that we receive. But how can we do that when we're receiving things on our social media like this that um, you know, refer to, to research? The best way is to look at trusted resources. So for example, the NHS have brilliant um, information on the websites, not just about neurodiversity, across health conditions. There's other websites like Science Media Centre who daily have um, articles on there where they distill down research that's been presented in the media or just basically new research that's come out and they describe this in a way that's suitable for everyone to understand. You may come across the Science Media Centre during COVID times because they were constantly obviously working to ensure that we were um, getting accurate information on, on the research that was presented to us during that time. I've been very, very active in this area, you heard in my introduction, and 10 years ago launched the project Research the Headlines. This isn't just about neurodiversity, this is about science communication in general, and I've overseen the release of, I think, about 350 blog posts now on every topic from astronomy, health, economics. So this is a multidisciplinary project as part of the Young Academy of Scotland. Of course, my special interest is neurodiversity, and as you can see, um, I blog about this. Often I write a blog because a parent will contact me and like the example I just gave you with the autism ep epidemic, they'll say, my friend has shared this post. I don't know how to, you know, describe this in a more informed way back, that that's not the case, etc. And then, you know, I'll, I'll blog about this. And what I want you to see as well is that I've co-written this with a PhD researcher in my team, Alva. And Alva's actually been working on that project in a more formal way. And what we've been doing is following an early career uh, researcher approach. So when Alva has commissioned people to write posts from the Young Academy, so senior academics, she's asked them to find an early career researcher in your team. And this is really important. In academia, getting your research into journals, into academic journals, is a high priority. But it's really, really important, as I've described really throughout this talk, that we get findings out to the public and in a way that's accessible to them. And it's really important that senior academics bring on those early career researchers and students so it just becomes their go-to, it's just the norm for them to do this. So I've talked about the parent, the teacher, the general public helping the neurodivergent child. I've arguably forgotten the most important set of people to children, their peers, their friends, the people in their class, they see headlines, they learn about neurodiversity on social media. They're not necessarily on the same social media as us, you know, Facebook and Twitter, they're on TikTok and other similar platforms. But go on TikTok, you will see countless videos about ADHD, dyspraxia, autism, etc. So it's really, really important 
that we upskill young people so that they understand the neurodivergent children in their class. And I've done this in a number of ways, but I'm just going to describe sort of one project that was aligned to the Research the Headlines project called Rewrite the Headlines. So this involves doing workshops, but in one very big project, we um, ran a national competition. So researchers from the Young Academy of Scotland went out and in person reached 2,000 children in Scotland in this competition with workshops. The workshops were called Don't Stop, Stop at the Headline. The idea was to give them a tip, a skill um, to, to work with. And they learned across that workshop ways in which to be critical consumers of the information that they're seeing. But in the interest of them, you know, active learning, being active learners in this, after the workshop, they went away with their teachers and chose a headline and rewrote the headline in relation um, to doing a little bit of research themselves with the teacher. And then they submitted these to us and we published them on the Research the Headlines blog. And then of course there was a set of winners and this is the actual uh, first uh, prize winners um, showing their prize there. So to end, to bring back to the burning question that's gone through this talk, how can we improve those poor outcomes I described at the beginning. For researchers, I think, I hope I've conveyed that it's really important that we listen to the voice of lived experience, neurodivergent young people themselves, those who care and work with them. But we all can play a role. I hope I've conveyed that we all can play a role in ensuring optimal outcomes for these young people. And I just want to leave you with the massive amount of contributors um, to, to the EPIC project, um, which spans researchers, public engagement people, clinicians, our brilliant family and professional group, and of course the children, parents and teachers who've taken part in the research, and not to forget the funders and the clinical services who've made the work so possible. Thanks very much. So thank you so much, Sinead, for that fascinating and really inspiring talk. Um, so in a minute, we're going to get to the bit that we're here for, apart from your lecture, which is the presenting of the actual award and the drink afterwards, may I add. But before we do that, we're going to give the audience an opportunity to ask any questions. So you're going to have to earn <laughs> this final stage, uh, Sinead. So if anybody has any questions, we have a couple of roving mics. Um, gentleman over there, if we could get a mic to him. Thank you very much indeed for a very exciting lecture. I'd like to take you back to a statement you made, a statement you made about changing the lens through which the young people and the children view mm. themselves. I think that's critically important. But I'd also like you to spend a couple of minutes on um, how that might be done and respond to what could be a really radical idea that we stop identifying such conditions as ADHD and ASD as mental health conditions. Because what happens, I believe, when we do that, is that they languish on an NHS assessment meeting And at the end of that, if they are considered to have met criteria, they go on to potentially treatment waiting list and very often the medical or the health model takes over to a greater or lesser extent. How about saying that these are not mental health conditions and that the method by which we assess young people and adolescents to have such conditions is made more broad, is made more multidisciplinary and that leads to optimal outcomes quicker, and most importantly, along with the optimal outcomes, the child and young person would not have come in contact with the service that may stigmatize them, and that they will not have a digital mental health risk assessment made on them, which will exist for all their life. Thank you. Okay, so there's a lot of different parts to that question. 
Um, firstly, I wasn't referring to them as mental health conditions. When I referred to mental health conditions, I was referring to the high risk of developing depression and anxiety. I think the whole approach that I'm describing is actually addressing that what, what you're saying, in that we're trying to work with the child from the point at which their difficulties are first recognised. And we're also very much trying to take a strengths and difficulties approach so that the child is bolstered from the beginning. But the reality is that these children have difficulties and as much as you can sh you know, change the environment around and that really, really does help, we need them to understand how best to navigate those kind of environments. And that's really what this, this work is doing. Um, to, to, so by the time that they get to the top of the waiting list, that they have a better understanding of that condition, or not as the case may be, because a lot of them don't go on to um, receive the diagnosis. So how about uh, spreading the method of assessment a little wider? <coughs> The NHS and the system. Perhaps, uh, can I ask, because we've got quite limited time, if anybody else has a question, can we, um, we've got two people there, so um, the lady in the purple coat. As a parent of a very neurodiverse child, I just want to thank, thank you very much for your very thoughtful and very human approach to this, and it's actually deeply refreshing, so thank you. Um, a question about, you talked about embedding things in practice. We've got a situation where CAMS is almost beyond a joke, the state of collapse that they're under. We've got support for learning units within schools, if people can even access that, that are completely overwhelmed. We, we have to get this embedded in a, in a, in a, in for the far greater reach. What, 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 are your, what are you doing about that, or, 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 and how could we assist that to happen? So in talks like this, I often get these types of questions that are focused on CAMS and clinical services and that assessment. I'm not actually a clinician, so I'm a psychologist, researcher, and public engagement expert. Um, all I can say is that with our approach, so we're translating this into a not-for-profit social enterprise to fill that huge gap that we have that these children are on waiting lists and their parents and teachers are saying that they need more support. I can't address the CAMS I issue. I, I, I fully um, understand you know, the difficulty of these long waiting lists and, and around that. I'm not a clinician. I, I don't work within CAMS. I partner with them and I know how difficult you know, it is to work with CAMS and how um, you know, they are trying to navigate, you know, these long waiting lists, medication waiting lists, you know, for ADHD, for example. And what we're trying to do, you know, you know I have the clinical services that have worked here. They have been phenomenal in the time because they don't have time, but in giving us the very little time that, that they have for us to progress this research, which has now gone from a research study to the real possibility, because by the end of this year, um, our, well, within a few months, our services will be operational, offering these kinds of services that parents in particular, but also teachers, are saying they really need. It's a really difficult system, and there's no magic wand in terms of, of CAMS. But with this kind of work, you know, we're, we're just really um, trying to make as, as much of a difference as, as we can. Thank you. And I think we have one more uh, question from the back there. Hello. Um, I am a parent of two neurodivergent children, and I'm also a primary school teacher, so I recognise that a lot of children in front of me, and I try and do everything I can for them. But to be honest, when you are trying to deal with sort of 30 children, paying me off in different directions, treating every child as an individual, I'd have to say it's almost impossible. Maybe that's just me. Anyway. Um, I think what the ethic um, resources that you were kind of offering look really good and I think maybe doing them individually is just not going to happen um, because the, the teachers just won't have time out of class but doing them as a whole class and teaching children how their brains develop, how different brains work in different ways, I think it could be done whole class very well um, and I'd be very interested in going on some workshops. But also how do I get hold of this ethic stuff? 
So first to say where this whole approach has been about identifying what does this best look like? And we've had that feedback numerous times. And now we've actually had someone deliver it in a whole class approach. And we are about to start a project next month where we develop a whole class approach. But we also do have children who have one-to-one -one support. And there, those teachers are asking us for a one-to-one -one version. So what we're really trying to do is to make sure that everybody is getting this in the way that they want to. So we've got like all of these different versions now. People now say to me, what does Epic look like? And I'm, it used to be like this one, one program, but that's how it needs to be. And I totally get, for, for some people, it will need to be in, in a whole class approach. And we'll have that within the next few months. To find out more, I think you've just been handed a leaflet. Yeah. <laughs> we've got leaflets that will take you, there's QR codes that will take you to um, our uh, website, the university website, as well as the blog. There's links to free downloadable resources on there and all of the contact details and the kind of things that we, uh, services. Our next thing will be workshops in June that we're offering for parents and teachers. Um, and yeah, that information can be accessed through the leaflets. They'll be near where the wine reception is. Great, thank you very much. So I think now I just want to thank you, Sinead, for that excellent lecture. Um, and really more broadly on behalf of all of the audience and everyone that you work with and have um, helped through your engagement and through your research uh, for this fantastic uh, research for all of your activities on such an important and as we've seen from the questions really complex issue so thanks so much um, and um, we now present you with the, the award if you'd like to just come out here Sinead <laughs> This is Thank the you very much. Tim DL Award. So, Thank you. And if you'd like to join us for a drink afterwards, we'd be absolutely delighted. Thank you very much for attending.